further delay. Okay, everybody, welcome to our uh, Department of Marine Geosciences uh, weekly seminar series. And today we are moving to a new country. We never had your country. By the way, Milika, we are moving to Serbia. I feel like the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> Um, so today we're hosting uh, Dr. Milika Kajanin from uh, the um, University of Belgrade in Serbia. So uh, Milika received her uh, BSc in Geology and Master in Sedimentology from the Faculty of Mining and Geology of the University of Belgrade in Serbia. She completed her doctorate studies and defended her PhD thesis in the field of physical geography at the University of Toronto, Canada. Then Milita, Milika lectured geology, geochemistry, and environmental sciences courses at several national and foreign institutions and participated in a number of research projects funded by the Serbian, European Union, and Canadian scientific uh, programs. Her main research interests are related to landscape sensitivity to environmental changes, mostly regarding weathering and erosion processes in badlands and fluvial systems. She is co-chair of the Badland Working Group as part of the International Association of Geomorphologists. Milika is an associate researcher professor at the Institute of Chemistry, Technology and Metallurgy at the University of Belgrade. So thank you very much. And today, Milika is going to talk about the connectivity within fluvial system provenance and origins of heavy metals in river sediments. Yep. Exactly. Thank you. So okay. The is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Okay. I will share the screen. Okay, now it works. Okay, uh, thank you uh, a lot. Thank you, Nicholas, for this introduction and for the invitation. It's my great pleasure and uh, honor to be here and uh, share some uh, research results with you. Uh, the, as Nicholas has mentioned, the, today's topic uh, of, of the talk is uh, connectivity with, within uh, fluvial systems about river sediments and uh, especially heavy metals and the transport of heavy metals by these sediments. And this topic is maybe not directly related to, to the course that you are uh, now uh, listening, but again, we, you will agree that everything in geology is related and that it all begs to one, one system, to one earth, to, to, to our planet. And, uh, and just to remind you, uh, as we know, Earth as a planet is an open system uh, regarding energy, right? So we are receiving light from the sun and the earth is transmitting long wave energy, uh, like heat uh, back. But regarding uh, the matter, uh, earth is a closed system. So there is only a very subordinate uh, portion of cosmic dust that's entering uh, earth and it's not really, um, taken into account as a material input to the earth so everything we have on earth and uh is of is of natural origin uh starting from raw materials we use to all the artificial or man-made or anthropogenic um material we make uh, actually has a natural origin and that's that's important uh, to remember uh, of course, in uh, our uh, Earth, uh, we have different spheres, four of them are uh, usually most importantly mentioned, atmosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, and hydrosphere. And no need to, to talk more about that. I'm sure that you are very uh, familiar with them. Today, we are going to stay mostly in the hydrosphere, but really very related to the lithosphere. And of course, uh, between some spheres, the boundaries are very uh, strict, can be seen, but they're all, all very interactive. Uh, another principle, basic geological principle, um, I would like to remind you of is uniformitism, which is again learned in the early geological courses, which says that everything that is happening, we observe happening today on Earth, as geomorphological processes, for example, uh, are happened the same way in geological past. And that's very important 
uh, principle for all geology, of course, but uh, especially for river sediments and transport of materials. When we look closely to the river systems on Earth, it looks like a vein system of land. It's transporting material from the mountains to the seas and the oceans 24-7 all the time from very steep, high mountain regions, hills, valleys, down, down to the sea. And it's uh, presumed that the rivers annually transport about 20 billion of tons of sediments to the sea annually. And it's a, it's a key role in, uh, in erosion processes, in marine sedimentation, in biogeochemical processes. And that's very important uh, to remember. And of course, material is transported from some source to a sink. Source is, of course, high mountain regions where precipitation has its a huge role in preparing material for, for erosion, the weathering processes, mechanical, biological, and chemical. Uh, preparing material and after precipitation, rain and snow, the material is moved down by little streams, but very fast, uh, connecting all to, to a larger system. Then main transportation goes on uh, through the valleys. Usually the coarser material is left behind and the finer material is transported until it finally reaches the sink uh, the sea or the ocean where the sediment, the huge amount of sediment is coming in and it's deposited across natural river deltas and flood plains. And of course, um, some of it also goes the, uh, together with, uh, with, uh, with the water to, to the sink, to the sea. So it's uh, uh, important to, to look at what is a watershed or drainage basin or catchment area or river basin. These are all synonyms that can be used. And by definition, a watershed is a surface area uh, which uh, runoff is resulting from precipitation from rainfall collected and drained to a common uh, point. Uh, of course, all, like I mentioned uh, previously, comes down from springs. Tributaries come in, they uh, connect together to, the, to a confluence. And of course, coming down to a delta and to the ocean. This dotted line here is extremely important for a watershed because it's a drainage divide. It's uh, that's the point where, if the uh, drainage basin uh, is like a funnel, it collects all the material and covers down, comes down to 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 one basin. And the drainage divide actually divides two basins, like uh, watershed and river basins are in most part of the earth, of course, with the extreme uh, climates are one next to another. So some are uh, very narrow and steep and joining or adjacent to, to a larger and, and wider ones. And drainage divide is actually dividing where material comes from. So anything that is eroded from this part will end up in the drainage basin too. And across the divide, of course, anything to one. And that's very important uh, in order to determine the source of the material. So it's topographically uh, separated. Uh, another uh, diagram that I'm a think you're aware of, I'm sure you are, It's but it's very useful for this topic is to define uh, where, when, and uh, uh, rivers erode, transport, or deposit. And it's a Hillstrom diagram in, from 1935, so more than uh, 80 years ago, uh, where on x-axis we have a gradient sizes of different uh, different size uh, from clay particles through sand to uh, pebbles. And on the y-axis, the, the flow velocity in centimeters per second. And, and so what's particular, of course, expected that we need high flow velocities to move very large particles, which is, of course, normal. And it's, it's not a surprise. But almost about the same flow velocity is needed to move the fine uh, fine clay particles because of cohesion, because they come together. And a very high velocity is particularly important uh, so in their erosion. And both of these end members are telling you a different, a different story. So to move large pebbles and cobbles and boulders, uh, you need uh, steep, uh, topogra topography, you need high velocity flows, but also, uh, and they are, of course are deposited as soon as the flow velocity comes down. 
but for very tiny clay particles, you also need high velocity flows. And uh, a large amount of that material is moved uh, when, when we have large floods, when we have very um, um, high velocity flows that are capable of moving a lot of this material. So they're telling you whatever we find in these sediments is uh, again, very peculiar. It's not very uh, often that a large amount of this material is moved. But again, uh, silt, sand, and probably a little bit of gravel is every day's river life. Whatever we, when we pass by a river, that's what's mostly transported. A little bit of clay, silt, fine sand. And that's, they um, have trace of what is happening day by day. So each of these materials and different flow velocities is telling you something. And here I just uh, placed the photograph where you can see different, uh, different uh, size material moved in a one riverbed. Uh, depending on the uh, energy of the flow. And of course, it's uh, the type of settlement and transport of material works if you take a vial with different sizes of material and mix it well up, shake it in 24 hours, it'll soon and easily be separated, probably even sooner. Similar to that, we have distribution of uh, down the valley where the biggest boulders are left behind as soon as the flow energy stops, uh, declines, and then the gravel is uh, stopped, and then sand, and then the finest, uh, finest uh, material. And uh, this is a nice photo from, from a paper I could recommend reading for uh, riverbed sediments, but it's uh, what I wanted to show you here is a little bit maybe of um, in introduction to what I will emphasize later on is different sedimentation um, by, by a river where high energy and low energy flows change. And uh, of course you have sequences with fine material and then sequences with larger material. That's, that's all uh, uh, not, not very surprising. But in this photo where we have mostly a medium and fine grain material, we have this one piece of larger rock. And so if uh, anyone, if you would up to saying, okay, let's see what's the medium size grain material here, what would you do? Would you take this piece into account or you wouldn't? Any statistician, any statistical analysis would say that this is an outlier, right? Because it's too big. It doesn't fit with, with the rest of material. But again, and that's probably true. And if you really wanted the mean average value of the grain size at this particular time, you would take it out. But generally, it's that piece is telling you something. It's telling you that, yes, that material was available there at that time. And it's also telling you that the flow was capable of moving material of that size, of a larger size. And is it the only one because it's the only one available or the flow didn't have energy to move more. So never, uh, my message here is to never uh, look, uh, throw out liars easily when, when working in with the geological natural uh, samples. Uh, so, okay, I just let someone in, I hope that's okay. So what happens um, in the watershed can go kilometers away, it affects lake, a stream or a river. Uh, people, human settlements were always close to, to, the, to the water, of course, for so many different reasons. Food was available, the climates were nicer, water was there and for transportation. And that stayed like that from early human settlements uh, until today. And what we do is we build industry and urban centers in the river valleys. We make farms, so we so the food is closer. We go up in the mountains for uh, raw material, for mines, and build infrastructure and highways and whatever is uh, easiest to make our life easy, and that is fine. There's no problem with that. But every of these actions is affecting uh, the watershed the sediments, uh, the water, of course, 
and is it's leaving our trace on the on the sediments and affects the whole watershed. So here we have to ask a question: uh, How is it affecting, and what exactly are we doing? So when scientists first started thinking about this topic, they were thinking, okay, what, is, what was the size of material, the composition, where did it come from? And then with climate change awareness and pollution awareness, uh, questions asked to how is, what, is this material uh, polluted and what, in which way, with uh, where did the pollution come from? And then the question changed to how can we, um, take this back, how can we assess this and uh, help restore nature. But here we will go a step back and uh, look more into, uh, is this actually, are these sediments polluted? How do we know if the sediments is polluted or the uh, heavy metal composition in them has a natural origin or its, its origin is some pollution source? And to do that, uh, there are a number of uh, pollution indexes developed, uh, which uh, help us determine the status, pollution status of, of sediments. And there are a number of them, maybe 10 or 15 different pollution indices. I have here chosen to show you only three, but basically they work um, around the same principle. They work um, comparing the actual measured value. So you take your sediment, you do chemical analysis, you determine the composition of heavy metals or, or uh, in it, you have some concentration, and then you compare it to some background value. And the question here is what background value do you use? How do you choose a background value? Is there one that is that can be widely chosen and applied to, to different uh, sediments? or does every particular uh, case has its own? And it's a difficult question and it's a difficult answer, but let's look at some examples. Uh, uh, so if we look at this, these are randomly uh, chosen photographs of rivers I found on Google, no particular uh, interest, just to, to find uh, examples of something that looks very polluted uh, and probably would uh, the, the, the concentrations of, of pollutants is high in these rivers and both in sediments. Uh, probably in this one, if there is some industry, there is definitely some pollution in the fine grain material and something that looks uh, quite pristine and clean, but it doesn't have to be like that. These are around the world. In, uh, in Serbia, we are working with a number of rivers and this is uh, part of a uh, stretch uh, close to Belgrade of Danube. And uh, Danube is one of the biggest rivers in, in Europe. And again, we have in the vicinity of, of, of the city, we have different situations. We have something that's almost complete, for sure, polluted sediment, uh, semi-polluted and maybe unpolluted, we're not sure. But how do we choose what background to use? And in the literature, mostly and widely used is uh, maybe I would say in 80% of papers, uh, average composition of continental crust is used as the background sample. So what, what is done? the actual measured concentration of uh, heavy metals of any one chosen uh, is compared using the, the index with the average composition of continental crust. That's mostly used. Second choice is average composition of a shale because mostly pollutants are bound to a uh, fine fraction. So it's usually the heavy metals are determined in the fraction that is sift below 63 micrometers. Uh, so to the very fine uh, uh, grain size uh, portion of the sample. So there is a, a different uh, composition of uh, shales around the world were taken and their average composition was taken uh, to compare to the, to the measured values. The third method is statistical method and I will I will show you a few examples here because it, it, it is interesting and how it works and what what this needs to be known. 
And the fourth, and probably uh, the best, I have to say right now up front, is the natural background samples, which is they correspond to the watershed that we are actually uh, working in. So just quickly to go over the, the um, concentrations of um, heavy metals in continental crust and shale, uh, they are given quite a long time, maybe 50, 60 years ago, uh, to and they're and they're used as background values. But if even if you compare those, you see the difference. You see in arsenic, the continental crust average composition is 1.8, and in shale 13, which makes actually a huge difference if you uh, if you are using that as a background value. And cadmium, which is uh, really low concentration, 0.1 can make a difference. Chromium, copper, nickel, not so much. Mercury, there is again a higher difference. Lead difference between 12.5 and 20 can make uh, can make a difference. And zinc also, depending on the on the values, could. Taylor, the same author, gave the uh, average composition of basalt and granite. Uh, areas, which is again also useful because the, the biggest recommendation is when you're working with um, uh, sediments from a watershed, river sediments, recent, uh, always look at the geology so you know what's what area is drained, what type of rocks or sediments are drained. So like I said, 70 or 80 even percent of uh, in papers, researches that work with uh, recent river sediments are using one of these uh, methods for, for the composition. Uh, more and more in the literature, statistical methods are used. And uh, it has its advantages, but it also has its downsides. And let's look at both. So here in this table, I have uh, put some average uh, and, uh, concentrations of, uh, I made it up. I completely made up this for imaginary watershed, the composition of, of five elements. And just by looking at, at your data, you can see that for chromium, there are some higher concentrations in one reach, maybe in some other points as well here for nickel. And statistical approach works this way. So uh, you uh, calculate the average of the composition of all elements you need. And then you calculate the standard deviation. And then you multiply standard deviation by two. And you finally add the mean and the standard deviation. And that's the upper limit of your data set. So we, for this data set, for chromium, for example, only, let's look at that element, we have 598 as an upper limit. So what do we have to do? We uh, take out all samples that are above that value. And we have only one, 600. So in the next approach, we take 600 out. We repeat the whole process, the mean, the standard deviation, multiply by two, added by the mean. And then we get up with, we come up with 500.74. And again, we have two samples here that are below 500. And then repeat again. And then finally, we get up, get down to 137.78, and all our data is below that value. So the mean value for these samples, for these data sets are taken as a background value. And that's one method how to use statistical approach to, to calculate uh, background value uh, for river sediments. And it works fine. If uh, we have diverse, non-uniform data, that means if we have data that are low and high, then we can say that uh, that the using this method, the values we get with statistical approach can be applied. And let's try it. So using using uh, this uh, average values and these concentrations. We calculated here the geoaccumulation index. And what did we find out? Uh, geoaccumulation index is one of the pollution indices. It compares the 
actual measured concentrations with a background value. We, we got our background value by statistical approach. And anything above 0 0.1 indicates some source of pollution. So here we can find that we have pollution with chromium on four points, on uh, copper with, uh, sorry, made a mistake here, with, with nickel on this point, and with the zinc we have here on these points. So we can definitely say that these points, uh, that these locations are probably have some, uh, have some uh, pollution by statistical approach. And so we can go back and look and maybe take additional samples or look at the pollution sources in this area. But if we look at the, uh, the same data, the, the data set for, for same points, but we have a more uniform data set. There's but a lot higher concentrations if you, if you notice. So we had the highest in the previous examples of 600. Here we have the highest of, uh, 1345 that's the highest point so this is these are concentrations are a lot higher and then you apply this statistical approach again mean standard deviation two times standard deviation and the upper limit nothing goes up and then you apply this you you use these uh, data mean as a as a background value for for the data set you virtually get no pollution whatsoever so it doesn't work with uniform data. So we have data with no pollution in your river and that's fine. Statistical approach says there's no pollution. But again, if you have uh, uniform data, but all concentration high, the whole river is polluted, sediments in the whole river are polluted, statistical approach will not help you. So you have to understand your data before applying any, any of the methods. And another statistical approach is uh, um, involving uh, drawing graphs, the, uh, calculating cumulative frequency graphs and plotting concentrations and cumulative frequency graphs on the double logarithmic scale. And uh, the turning point between the data indicates your background value. That's how it works. Uh, in ideal case, I have tried it a number of times and it doesn't work so nicely, but it's always worth a try because it's very nice representation and it gives you, uh, gives you a sense where does the actual data change. Sometimes, of course, you can have a two arrow point turning. And so the first one at the 70%, so indicating zero to 70, we, we have uh, background values that are natural, and then from 70 to 80 might be influenced by humans and probably uh, under anthropogenic origin between 90 to 100. That's when you have two turning points. And coming back to general characteristics of natural uh, background samples, uh, it's probably hardest to collect them because they have to be uh, actually drilled, they have to be taken and not from the surface, from abandoned meander, probably somewhere here, because they have to uh, belong to the same watershed. They have to have this very similar composition, uh, pre-industrial uh, time of deposition, so free of any anthropogenic origin. And uh, all the geochemistry and geomorphology of reaches has to be taken account to. So it has to be ideally drilled in abandoned meander. And uh, it works really well with small watersheds because it's the uniform geology and it's probably uh, easy to find the spot where these uh, sediments can be extracted, uh, drilled from. Of course, it, it, like, it takes a lot more uh, effort to, to get into these, to get these uh, sediments. But what do we do when we have a natural uh, large river system, like, for example, Danube River that is uh, 2,800 uh, kilometers long and drains a huge area with, with nine countries? And um, with uh, 114 stations along the river, it makes a huge amount of data, but it's using the different techniques. It cannot be really readily compared. So in a very nice 
paper published in Chemistry in 2003, uh, they they did a detailed sampling of all the all the uh, locations along the Danube, and the minimal concentrations uh, they recommended as reference sample for Danube River, which really is uh, very uh, valuable uh, data that that is that can be widely used. They also find interesting results that the lowest pollution was in Hungarian plain and the highest here on the Serbian-Romanian border at the Iron Gate uh, Lake, which I will mention again later. So this is a way, again, to do a natural background selection of samples on the huge watershed, on the, on the large watersheds, just to take a lot of samples and, and then um, just choose the minimal ones, uh, minimum concentrations and and that that are your background values what we did in, uh, in one of our papers is uh, try to use the data set from the uh, river in northern serbia tisa river which is uh, actually uh, springs in romania and uh, is a northern tributary of danube and uh, we had this many sampling uh, points which we then used and calculated pollution indices uh, with uh, different background values. And we have chosen elements associated with human activity that pose some kind of uh, risk. And when uh, uh, you compare uh, obtained background values with continental crust, I have mentioned before, and shale, and using statistical methods, both the statistical methods I have uh, shown you here, and these are the core sediments, the natural uh, background values, you can see what is the difference. In case of some elements, the difference is huge. And uh, generally, the statistical methods show lowest, uh, in some cases, um, uh, background values, but not in all. But it whatever comes uh, in in first thing you observe is they're very very different, and that of course affects your your results. So the rule is there is no rule. You have to be very careful and cautious. Uh, what what do you cho choose to compare your actual data with? So again, we compared in this study. We compared the we calculated the enrichment factor and compared uh, the actual data with different background values, and you see that there are huge differences. If we say that there is um, some pollution between one and three, you see that in case of some elements there is like uh, lead. We using these background values, uh, natural ones, there is pollution, statistical, there is not, zinc, same case. Again, between three and five, moderate enrichment with continental cross shale and natural background, and using statistical approach, there is none. Same for the other uh, geoaccumulation index. Again, we get uh, completely uh, different results. So uh, our inclination here was to use natural background values because that's a general recommendation. Whenever you can, you you go for that. You choose, uh, you find your natural uh, samples and use them as a background value. That's the safest and probably the best way uh, to do. These are all the rivers we have uh, investigated and, and done uh, similar uh, similar research uh, in Serbia, and it all all belongs to the Danube watershed. But now I will talk uh, more about uh, the Iron Gate or Gerda Lake uh, at the border here of uh, Serbia and Romania, which is recently last year or maybe the year before that uh, became a geopark. And it's a very, very nice, uh, exceptionally nice landscape. Uh, in 1972, actually on tomorrow, <laughs> it will be um, an anniversary of uh, when the dam was uh, built and started working and changed the landscape. And that's when the, uh, the Iron Gate Dam, or uh, the Jardab, how we call it, lake, uh, uh, was was made, 
And in the middle of that lake, there was a nice town of Donya Milanovac, which was had to be moved completely and is flooded. And only when the waters are really low, you can see the top roofs of the house and the churches coming out of the water. But the whole city was was moved to, to another location and, and uh, lives there now. So uh, what we did in this, in this study is wanted to see uh, how did, did the, the position of sediments change over time. So we know that uh, we, we chose the between here Serbia and Romania border at location Orlova, it's right here. Uh, what was previously an agriculture field. So we know that the deepest sediments were deposited in 1972. And this area has uh, quite a uniform geological setting. So we know that material is coming uh, from a very similar source. And we wanted to see how, what did, how did the position change of both sediments and in size and uh, by composition. And this is what we got. This is the whole uh, 135 uh, centimeters uh, deep core with 11 samples that we did some uh, grain size analysis. And uh, of course saw that mostly granite fragments in the sand, sand fraction, which is corresponding to the geological, to the area. It's interesting that the sand is uh, has highest um, amount in the lowest part when when actually the dam was built and the, the huge amount of runoff and the sediment was just settling down in this area. And finally, in the last part, which corresponds to huge flood we had in, in 2014. And by dividing uh, the, the size, the meters and uh, the years, we have the corresponding uh, correspondence of three meters per year of the positional time, which is about an average for this, this type of environment. So what did we do? We uh, uh, did in, on these 11 samples, we did, uh, we determined the heavy metal concentrations. And we found out some very interesting fluctuations in all of them. And try to determine uh, the year that they that happened. So the first one is corresponding from 1972 when the actual uh, lake was formed uh, for another uh, seven or six years, and uh, 1979, where a lot of material is still when the dam was built and, and uh, the environment has not adjusted, a lot of runoff came into the lake and deposited at that time. So there's the high sand concentration, a lot of heavy metals of natural origin or artificial different material. We cannot really take into account that it's uh, that it's there is any actual pollution there. Uh, in the 80s up to 90s, there was a relatively stable uh, economy and industry um, development. A uh, huge industry development in the 80s in, in the country. And that's where we had uh, this fluctuation, a little bit of rise in, in heavy metals. But then the sediment drop uh, was in the 90s. I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, with the history of this region and, uh, and uh, Yugoslavia, the big country falling apart. And uh, so sanctions were imposed to, to, to Serbia. And so our industry completely stopped, ceased. We didn't have anything going on. And that actually we can see the drop in heavy metal concentrations uh, in during these years. And uh, finally, we again get an increase in 2001 to 2005. And there are two possible possible reasons for that. One is uh, the biomatic uh, cyanide spill in Romania in 2000, where is, is a mine here in, in Romania on Tissa River, where is a huge spill and all the material and the pollution uh, moved through, through Tisa River down through Hungary to Serbia and down to Danube and eventually coming down here to the Iron Gate 
Iron Gate Lake, uh, 2,000 uh, uh, square meters of zinc, lead, and copper contaminated water came down. And uh, it, it was a huge incident and uh, had consequences for, for several time. The second possible uh, explanation for the, the rise in, in uh, contaminant pollu pollutants at that time can be the NATO bombing of Serbia and Montenegro that occurred in 1999. So besides weapons with depleted uranium, uh, there was a bombing of oil refinery and with a huge pollution of fair water and uh, soil that ended up, of course, in, in rivers, uh, all rivers, Sava and, and eventually Danube. And that could be one of the possible uh, explanations for, for the rise of, of heavy metals. And again, we had a drop in the concentration in all heavy metals in, in another sequence, 2006, 2009, where we had more environmental laws followed, uh, a more stable economy, and uh, and that helped uh, to keep uh, pollutants in um, uh, not expanding or, or or spreading out so much. And uh, finally, again at the end of our sequence, we have a rise because in two, between deposited between 2010 and 2016, uh, probably caused by a, a huge flood in 2014, that again, anniversary these days, and again, we're having, having a heavy rain these days, uh, hopefully it won't cause anything like this. Although in some regions we have floods already, especially in, in Croatia and Bosnia now. And uh, so the cyclone Tamara affected large areas of, of southern, eastern, and central Europe, causing huge flood, floods and landslides. And the rain that came down was heaviest in the last 120 years. And well, 62 people died. A lot of them had to be moved. Hundreds of thousands of people forced to leave their homes. And, and that eventually all that material came down to Danube and deposited in the Iron Gate, causing this uh, rise in heavy metal concentrations. So by, we of course calculated the indices, that it wasn't important for this story. We used the, the Danube um, background values I have just showed you in, in the previous slides. But this uh, sequence uh, explains well how uh, the anthropogenic influence of of um, on sediment deposition in a in tranquil, quiet environment, uh, and that could be dated uh, easily. And uh, my uh, almost final uh, example again to always uh, think and look uh, more uh, to the um, geological composition of the area, or geological setting. Sorry, of the, of the area is is this. Uh, this is you recognize a geological map. It's a basic uh, geological map of Serbia, uh, one to one hundred thousand. One of the sheets. This is the Timok River, which is always well, not always, but usually considered as as pollutant because it um, drains some mines over there and tailings are um, ending up in the river. But it doesn't always have to be a case like that. Just to look at the geology here, number five, we have Paleozoic granite and metamorphic rocks. Here we have Cretaceous uh, carbonates. We have here uh, three contacts of gabbro and uh, carbonates. And of course, we have some tertiary sediments over here. So if we plot uranium thorium, uh, on, on X and, and Y axis, we can see easily that the high values, of course, indicating uh, granitic igneous uh, origin of, of sediments is, of course, connected to, to this number five, where we actually have these rocks. And um, the lowest values here are connected with the Cretaceous carbonates, which is, of course, uh, can be expected. But if we do uh, a copper arsenic plot, again, and both in PPMs, copper here on the x-axis, uh, arsenic here on the y-axis, we again can see that 
by by comparing to different background values and by concentration, we can say that there has been some pollution. But again, here the high values of uh, both copper and arsenic are corresponding to the same igneous origin of material of igneous origin here, both locations, and the lowest lower parts here corresponding to the uh, to the Cretaceous. Uh, carbonates. So again, uh, this is just a warning to be cautious when you find uh, high concentrations of uh, some heavy metals, not to go only uh, by uh, saying that there is a pollution. Geological settings is very important and, and has to be uh, taken into account. And that is seen on my uh, final slide as well, where um, uh, we compared uh, concentrations of nickel and copper, uh, um, cobalt, sorry. And um, uh, what we get is if this is the region, Balkan region here, and, and, and Serbia is around here, and we have Danube, right, and belonging to the Black Sea. So the material with the tributaries is coming either this way, draining like Danube, the, the Pannonian plain, or it's coming from this side, Carpado, Balkanetic Mountains. And then we see that this area, Pannonian Basin, by composition, it's a fine grain plus right, Pannonian um, material, very uh, naturally very rich in heavy metals. And therefore, we do have high concentrations of nickel and cobalt and corresponding to Sava and Danube to rivers draining this area. And the, the rivers draining the east part of the Balkan Peninsula are here where with low concentrations of nickel, but still higher concentrations of cobalt. And because usually we are always said that we have nickel pollution and nobody knows where it comes from, but it's actually natural, uh, has natural origin. So instead of conclusions, I have a few uh, take-home messages, is to always understand your data. It's not easy, but you have to, to, to look at it. Don't drop out outliers easily. Don't, uh, by having high concentrations of elements, concluding that there is pollution. Yes, there probably is, but might not be. Um, generally, uh, I would say that there is no one, no value that fits all. There is no one background that can be used. Pollution indexes are actually very nice and great for um, putting some boundaries about uh, around your data. But you have to be the one that thinks outside the box to accept these boundaries. If you just follow blindly, uh, I have a data set, I have a background value, I have calculated my, my in index, and that is either polluted or not. That's not the way to go. Pollution ind indices are great, but you always have to think uh, how, to, how to use them. And general recommendation is it's probably the, the time most time consuming and uh, most cost consuming to use a natural background value, but it's worth it. Just go out and drill uh, in the abandoned meander. Uh, statistical background values use with caution, like like everything, but you have to uh, see if if it's applicable. Uh, widely used continental crust and and shale are good. They usually give results, and it's published. But they also have disadvantages if not taking into account uh, natural uh, chemical variability. And that's all I had for today for you. So if you have any questions or Nicholas is, I'll stop sharing screen. Thank you very much, Milika. I'll stop sharing here. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Milika. It was very, very nice talk and providing a lot of information for something that we don't teach. We don't teach about rivers. So definitely our students need to know about that. So I open the podium for questions from the audience. Uh, just get in because I don't see all of you. And, and don't be shy, Milika doesn't bite. People? You're 
your side. Oh, there is in the chat something. I know it was a thank you for one of those oh, students. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, uh, then the, the talk was extremely easy for everybody. You're going to get uh, in, in the exam then. I, I, I want to ask if, um, if um, how do you deal with pollutants in, a, in, in, I don't know, in a river such as um, the Amazon, for instance, can you, use the methodologies that you are describing in such a large and the biggest the largest in the planet yes the largest in the planet it's it's uh, it's it's really difficult it has to be so i would recommend uh well from what i know to subdivide it into smaller basins to to define geomorphological uh separate parts and then uh, not use only one one value to to uh, determine the pollution in in the whole basin, but it has to be in different divided into different reaches and for them looked um, independently. Similar like for Danube, of course, Danube is the largest in Europe, but it's again a lot smaller than 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 the Amazon. So they took. Uh, hundreds of data and then they said the minimal data, the minimal concentrations we have, that's our background values. But I, I would say look for geology always in the basin and subdivide to geomorphologically different uh, uh, parts and then look at them individually. Thank you. Um, somebody else wants to ask something? Okay, Pars is asking, uh, in geology, we believe that Anthropocene um, started around 100, 1,850. What, yes. what is your take? Uh, well, to be honest, the Anthropocene is something that I'm, I'm quite interested in and, and actually was part of some um, uh, workshop, I would say. And we we actually talked about it a lot and should it be the uh, discovery of America, which is one one uh, possibility or the industry, the industrial revolution. Um, I'm I'm really not sure what what to say. Um, maybe the the biggest change was around 1850, but um, I would say that huge changes have been made uh, before. And uh, actually, when I read about it, I like the, the idea of the discovery of America uh, using that time as, as Anthropocene change. Okay. Uh, Marta is asking, have you done core samples offshore to look at changes in the position over geological time? Uh, core samples we did to, to find the uh, natural reference samples. Yes, for, for rivers. Yes. But we didn't, um, well, the, I, okay, now I understand. It's, uh, we, I, I participated in, um, in um, partly uh, in uh, uh, investigation of neogene lake stream basins, like geology, like real uh, sedimentology, and but that's only for uh, geological pur purposes, not for this type of uh, not this type of research. Okay, somebody has more questions. No further questions. Okay, so thank you again, Milika. No problem. Thank you. Thanks again for this invitation. And, I really uh, enjoyed it. I will get in touch with you about our uh, other business and sample. Yes. Okay. <laughs> of course. Okay. And thank you, everybody, thank you. and see you next week. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye bye. bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.